Open your Bible to Psalms chapter 26, and uh, we'll begin reading with verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Then you drop on down and look at verse 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. This is one of the great and marvelous pieces of literature that you'll find in any library anywhere in the world. It's absolutely incomparable in the expressions you find concerning the writer's feeling toward his God and toward his God's will for his life. I, if I were to title this message, it'd be only two words, and it consists of these, total surrender. Now, most of us know very little about that because we're alien to what it really means to have a total surrender to a project, or to an individual. But if I can in this message today, I'd like to set forth about five things that will help you to understand the innermost feelings of the heart of this writer. The one word that is so powerful is the very first word of the chapter, judge me. When any man tells the God of this universe to do that, He's asking for something. Because there's not very many people that's going to make a statement like that and not really mean it. Uh, you're not going to get that close to the God of this universe to express such a thought. A good many years ago now, I had met a friend of mine at the airport. His name was Dr. R.G. Lee long-time pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, one of the greatest orators, one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century. And uh, he uh, was talking to me as we drove from the airport. We were talking about men we'd known through the years. And he said, Brother John, don't ever get bitter. He said, it'll wreck you. Because we had mentioned two or three uh, men of renown and what had happened to them. Well, that recalled to mind uh, a thought, and I told him about another brother, friend that we had known. He was a longtime pastor of First Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas, Dr. Joe Henry Hankins. Both these men have been in heaven now a good long while. And Dr. Hankins and I were traveling together and... Uh, he made this statement. In fact, we were coming from the same airport because he was going to speak for Landmark on that weekend. And he said to me, Brother John, most all Christians are afraid of the will of God for their lives. Well, I wrote that statement down when I got to the office. Uh, I would put it in the memory bank. And quite often I had my little soul winners in the Testament. And I would turn to that statement and I would read it again. Nearly all Christians are afraid of the will of God for their lives. And it grew on me. And it began to get larger and larger. And I said to myself one day in a quiet time, there must be a scripture that, uh, that's related to this statement. And you know what? The Spirit of God directed me to the fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. And I found exactly what Dr. Hankins was talking about, that Christians, many of them, are afraid of the will of God for their lives. I don't think any of us that have been a Christian for a long period of time would be so bold as to say that there has not been periods when we were reluctant to really say, Lord, judge me. That's asking for a great deal, isn't it? Lord, Judge me. Have you ever been so bold as to make a statement like that? 
Well, I have a few times in my life. I can say it without reservation because the Lord knows my heart. But I'll tell you, you'll fear and tremble when you make a statement like that. You can mark it down in the book of memory that when you ask God to do that, there will be some things happen in your life. Lord, judge me. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all do that and do it really sincerely and honestly? Young people, I'd like to challenge your heart tonight. Please don't be afraid to do it. You're human like I am, like your pastor. But you that have been in the performance here before the broadcast started, could I encourage you to come to grips with the rights of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and you could say, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. He makes a statement here that's very bold. Now, we'll probably come back to that. I want you to notice the second word. It's in verse 2. Examine me. Now in the Corinthian letter, Paul said to examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. He said that to Timothy. And then in the observance of the church ordinance known as the Lord's Supper, he said for people to examine themselves lest they take the Lord's Supper unworthily. Now, a man, if he'll judge himself, he shall not be judged. But still, to be open with the Lord and be able to say, Examine me, O Lord. Notice how he says that. Isn't that a beautiful lesson? Examine me, O Lord. That means to open up uh, the uh, corridors of my life and the closets of my life and the secret chambers of my life and turn the light on and look at it, Lord. I don't want anything to be concealed. That means there can't be any shady deals. There can't be anything done under the table. That means that everything is open and above board and you're not ashamed for God to look at it, for God to scrutinize it, for God to put it on display. Examine me, O Lord. Now that's something. I'd like to challenge your heart, church. I believe this, if we're to have revival in our day, I'm now talking in a very limited sense. I'm not talking about in a general sense. I just read in the newspaper this past week where the population of the world stands at that particular writing at four and one-half billion people. Said it took uh, several million years to reach one billion. I don't know where they got that jazz. I mean, they must have eaten pizza and had a nightmare. Man's only been on the earth 6,000 years, and after 2,000 years, God sent a flood and destroyed all but eight souls, so uh, they missed it somewhere. Now, evidently, on computer and everything, and the surveys they've made, uh, there, of course, there's room for there's room for variance in those figures, but I'm quoting now what the, pa uh, what the paper said. Four and one-half billion people, uh, they are growing at a rate of about uh, five people per second or something like that. In that growth, it's, it's staggering. And you think what will happen in the next 15 years, world overpopulated and, and underdeveloped, uh, these are really strange days in which to be living. Now, we who are biblicists, we believe man's only been on the earth 6,000 years, and when that period of time's up, we don't know exactly where we are, but when it is, God's going to send uh, His Son, and, and the church will be caught out, and there will be seven years of tribulation, or close to that, and then the Lord Jesus will come back bring us back with him and there will be a thousand years of millennial peace. But something is going to happen one of these days. Now in the meantime, if we're going to have revival in our local churches, we're going to have to have some young couples and men and women that are willing to meet the test. We're going to need some young people that will stick up the flag of surrender and say, judge me, O Lord, and then they'll go even further and say, 
examine me. Now that, if you've ever been to a doctor and he's hit you on the knee and, or on the elbow and he's looked in your mouth and, and your ears and looked in your eyes and then you've gone into all kinds of x-rays and all of this, uh, it's quite an ordeal on occasions to have a thorough checkup, as they call it today, in medical terms. To see, And you know, it's a strange thing. I read in the paper the other day where a man had just been to the hospital and a man quite prominent had had a checkup and then he came down with a heart attack. He'd got the green light, everything was just fine, but it wasn't serious. He just had a heart attack and died. You know. But when you say to the great physician of heaven, examine me after you've said to him to, to uh, judge you, now that is where we need to come. I think every one of us here today should be able to say, Lord, if I'm not where I ought to be and doing what I should be doing, then help me to find my place. I'll tell you what would help a number of us around the, around the church is to talk to these people uh, like Al McGuffey and Olin Harmon that go out, they do survey work, our retirees that are, that are working, visiting every week, ladies that do calling, people that are teaching in the Christian school, Sunday school faculty, uh, the bus drivers, the people that are, uh, uh, that are filling places of responsibility, say, look, tell me something. Are you happy? Tell me how you feel about what you're doing. I'll tell you what you do. Pick out two men. Pick out a man that's active for the Lord. He ties and gives offerings. He comes from his station, passes out tracts. And then you talk to another church member that... He just comes when it's convenient and he doesn't tithe and he he's, uh, has a rebellious nature and talk to the two men and see what you think about it. That would be a good thing. I'll tell you what, I'll challenge any of you to go out here door knocking and take the names of absentees and visit them and if you're not backslidden within about six weeks, I'll apologize to you. The quickest way in the world to really get backslidden is to visit continuously absentees and listen to their lying and listen to their excuses and, and see them in their bitterness and in the disarray of their lives. It'll pull you down. You have to stay out winning souls to Christ to keep yourself built up because if you go to that other crowd all the time, they'll drain your resources. Amen. Do it every time. You can just mark it down that there are certain factors that you have to be aware of. All right, now this man is laying it on the line. He said, uh, judge me, O Lord, examine me, O Lord. And then the third word, he said, prove me in that same second verse. Now you talk about uh, real testing. That means to bring me up to the, uh, to the starting gate. See whether I've got it or not. See whether I'm real or not. Prove me. Put me in the race. Put me in the Christian race. Am I doing what I'm doing purely for self-gratification? Or am I doing what I'm doing for the glory of the Lord? You know, that's a good question I need to ask myself. Am I only preaching because I enjoy preaching? Or am I doing it because, like Paul said, Woe be unto me! if I preach not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're doing what you're doing through conviction, then you can say, prove me, O Lord. Now, that brings you to a, a larger, uh, an enlargement of this truth when you take uh, the word to judge and then to examine, and then you say, prove me see if I'm real or not. You know, it's quite interesting if you've ever been with a man that is really skilled in judging diamonds, precious stones. I was with a friend of mine that owns a jewelry store and he, uh, he had some stones uh, he's showing me and he said, uh, Dr. John, take this glass and pick this up with these uh, pinchers, you know, this little thing he had and said, uh, tell me which stone is worth the most. Well, first of all, I was judging that stone. I was to be a judge. Then I was, an exa I was examining it. And then 
uh, I, I, he was proving me to see if I knew really what I was talking about. Now, I was not an expert. I missed it. Well, I had a couple miss one. I did pretty good. He said it's exceptionally well. But still, I missed one. But I tell you, the God of this universe never misses. He never misses. And when this writer said, prove me, he's saying, take me up there and put me in a place of responsibility. See if I can, if I can meet the test. Oh, how wonderful this is. What a lesson is to be learned. Now, there's, uh, there's another word that, uh, that, we ought to, that we ought to look at in that second verse, and it's a simple little word, try. Try my reins. Now, you, when you find that in the Psalms, he's really talking about his strength. Try my strength and my heart. Look at my capabilities. See, see the, res the, the reserves that I have. Try me. All right, now you've got these four propositions. Judge me, examine me, prove me, try me. Put the heat on me. Put the pressure on me. You know, I think I've told you this story, but this big fellow I led to Christ down in Texas years ago, he was, uh, he was uh, an alcoholic. He had to have it. He'd get up of a morning and have a bottle of liquor and take a swig off from it uh, to get going for the day. And, and uh, he had just about lost everything. That's the way alcohol will do you. But uh, I led him to Christ, or he was saved in my church at a revival meeting we were having. And of course, I had witness to him and had been a real friend to him, and he got saved in that revival meeting. Well, he quit drinking immediately, poured out all of his liquor, just opened the bottles, poured it down the drain, threw the bottles away. Now, not long after that, when you've been on alcohol for so many years, you can get some terrible reaction. I don't care if you are saved. And uh, he had been a heavy smoker, three or four packs a day, and he quit smoking just like that, and quit drinking. Well, I saw that man on his body, on his arms, on his face, on his neck, on his chest, on his back, all over his body, whelps that break out as big as my thumb and larger, big, red, swollen, uh, looked like he'd been stung by a bee or something. And uh, there would be dozens of them on his body. And the irritation was almost indescribable. I remember one day we were together and, and he had gone with me to a meeting and we were in a hotel room and, and uh, he couldn't hardly stand his clothes to touch him and he pulled his shirt and his undershirt off and his trousers and they were just lounging in his, uh, in his shorts and, and uh, he was scratching and rubbing those things and, and finally he, he just burst out to crying and praying. He said, oh God, just lay it on me. He said, I don't know how much I can stand. But he broke down and sobbed. He said, I'm not going to go back to that bottle. I'm not going to turn back to the world. If I die, if my body becomes a sore from my head to my feet, I've always remembered that. It's sort of in line with what the psalmist was saying. Try me. Prove me. Examine me. Judge me. That man has been pastoring the same church now for 25 years. He's an old man now, and he's had a stroke, and he's had a, he's had a heart attack, and, and he's had a number of things happen to him physically, but sometimes he's so broken he'll sit in the chair and preach. But the people come to hear him, and people get saved in those oil fields, uh, those rig builders and those tough oil field workers. And he loves those people and little children will come and sit on his lap and hug him and call him grandpa and he'll cry and preach the gospel. He didn't turn back. He said to try me and prove me. See what I'm made of, oh God. I would to God that a great church as one person would come to your senses and before Almighty God, you and I could say from the senior pastor 
to the lowliest member. Judge me. Examine me. Prove me. Try me, O oh God. Now, he said five, eight times in verses 3 through 8, notice, I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat in vain with vain persons. Neither will I go in with dissemblers, that is, strife makers. Verse 5, I have hated the evildoers. I will wash my hands in innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O God. He said, I'll come to the altar. Verse 7, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell all thy wondrous truth. Now you see, after all of this had happened, he begins to tell eight different times, I this, I'll not sin, I will refrain from evil. And then he said, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell all thy wondrous works. You want me to tell you what's wrong with a lot of you people sitting here today? You haven't been in verses 1 and 2, and you dead sure can't get in verses 3 through 8. You'll never go to verses 3 through 8 until you get through verses 1 and 2 of this chapter. You'll never be able to say the other until you have submitted to these four propositions, judge me, examine me, prove me, and try me. You'll never make it. Now you look at that. Then, verse 7, that I may publish with a voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. I've often wondered, why is it that a great number of the body of Christ, they're so glum and so tight-lipped and so unwilling to tell of the mercies of God? Why can't we talk about the goodness of God? If we've trusted Him as our Savior, if we love Him with all of our heart, then God's people ought to praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. I tell you, my friend, you and I are phony unless we have passed through Psalms 26. We're not real. Unless we have walked through these truths. Now we come to verse 7. Isn't it strange that verse 7 does not precede verses 1 and 2? That I may publish. He's linking now what he's going to do with what he has requested. That I may publish with a voice of thanksgiving and tell all thy wondrous works. You get the implication of that. You get the thrill of that. As I oftentimes sit on this platform and I look out across this congregation, I see people that have told me the doctor said you have cancer. Some of you have, have had open heart surgery. Some of you have diseases that you'll never overcome. Some of you older people have been stricken with this and that of various ailments and common sense and just sound judgment tell you that you'll never live another day feeling absolutely well like you felt when you was a young person. I want to ask you tonight, with all these things in mind, where is Jesus in your life? And then you young people and you teenagers and young adults and young couples, let me ask you a question. When you come to grips with what we've studied in verses 1 and 2 and what this man had to say in the honesty and integrity of his heart. I will wash myself in innocency. He declares boldly to the Lord God of this universe about himself and he wanted all of that to happen so that he might publish with thanksgiving and tell of the wonderful works of God. It's about time that we decided in this complicated society that we would begin to praise the Lord and talk of His goodness, tell of your love for Him, begin to share with other people uh, the love of the Lord Jesus that's in your heart. How will people know you love Him unless there's expressions of it? But I'll declare to you, in the context of what we've studied 
It's hard to say that you love the Lord and say it with honestly, honesty unless you have said, Oh, God, judge me. Oh, God, examine me. Oh, God, prove me. Oh, God, try me. And when we've come to that, then we can face a gainsaying world and say, I love the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works toward the children of men. We've let Satan come in slyly and beguile us with so many things. And unsaved people, you breathe God's air. You live on God's soil. God has given you the precious commodity of life. There's not anything more precious than life itself. And you have not given one word of gratitude in return to Almighty God. How can we say, Oh God, bless my home? when we have not passed through Psalms 26, verses 1 and 2. You question the credibility of the Bible on the matter of a lake of fire? Let me ask you something, my friend. When he died that terrible death on the cross, when he was made an offering for sin, his body was abused, he was stripped, he was tried, he was spit upon, he was smitten, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. He, like a lamb, was led to the slaughter, suffered all of the curse of the cross. What have I done for him? That's the question. When I think about the extremities of the grace of God, that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. When I think of the all-encompassing grace of God and how little I uh, can do for Him and how reluctant sometimes we all are to do for Him, we give as little as we can to get by, we offer services as little as we can to get by, we'll serve God a little while and then withdraw ourselves. God help us to get into the living like this man and live our lives in dedication to him. I want to ask you, do you think a man wins to set himself in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ? Common sense tells you you can't win. Now this man is giving us the picture. Now, the beautiful and wonderful thing is down to the text in verse 8. Lord, notice how precious he addresses the master of the universe. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. I like people, I love people that honor the house of God. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. You know those Jews, those ancient people, that tabernacle in the wilderness, they camped around it. Four tribes on the north, four tribes on the south, or th three tribes, three tribes west and three tribes east, twelve tribes of Israel. And they encamped in those wilderness years on either side of the tabernacle. The tabernacle in the wilderness. They observed the feast days. That tabernacle meant something to them because within the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant and all of those sacred and holy uh, uh, and divine things that God had consecrated for His use. And people, let me tell you something. You don't play with holy things. And when you've been saved, you belong to God and you need to be careful that you don't let the flesh supersede that which the Spirit wants you to do. The flesh lusteth against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh so that you cannot, you will not do the things that you should. You and I better walk lightly. When Moses came to that burning bush, he heard a voice out of infinitude that said, Moses, pull off thy shoes for thou art on holy ground. You know, back yonder in the days of Israel again, when that temple was built, there was not anything like it. There had never been a building like it. Gold, 
the, the, so much of it was overlaid with fine gold. There was so much beautiful wood in that and every precious stone. It is something beautiful to behold. No wonder those ancient people thought, oh, this is it. This is it. I've got, I've got information for you too. You know, when the day comes when our Savior stands yonder on Mount Olivet at the temple site, the temple will be there and it'll be something to behold. Are you with me now? Hear me. But in the church age, those of us that belong to the body of Christ, we've been washed in the blood and we, we are part of that body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter, uh, chapter 12 and verses 12 through uh, 26. Listen. You and I ought to assemble ourselves together with the body of Christ. It's important. What did he say in this? Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house. It means something to me. You think he ever had to be visited as an absentee? You think there was any reason for him to be absent? To absent himself from that assembly? From, you know what he said in the book of Matthew? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be in their midst. You better watch it, people, because the God of the universe looks down and he takes note of our situation and what value we place upon certain things. You notice how I said that? What value we place upon certain things. You can go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and you can look at the beautiful diamonds or you can go to London and you can see the crowns and the, and the beautiful diamonds and precious stones. You can go to other parts of the world and see where ancient rulers have ruled that land and they have certain, uh, they have certain things that uh, are most precious. I want to ask you something. Like a great pa a painting of Michelangelo or, or Da Vinci or some of them are the great poets and the books that they have written are the great songs, paintings, whatever it may be and the value they place, place upon them. What is important in your life as a Christian? The house of God. Now not just brick and stone but where God meets with his people. Now there's one other thing. And this is really the key to all of it. Verse 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house too. And the place. The place. Notice that. The place where thine honor dwelleth. He had spiritual perception to know where God's honor dwelleth. And he honored that. The place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in, the, in an even place in the congregations. Will I bless the Lord? Notice the great emphasis he places upon this because that's where God honor dwelleth. To honor him to extol him, to put him in his rightful place, men and women, your life and mine, it's important. Now, let's conclude by saying, two, within the body of every believer dwells the Holy Spirit of God. Within the body of every believer dwells the Holy Spirit of God. And where you go, whatever you may indulge in, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within your heart. He knows every move, every thought, every action. He said, if I go away, I will send the Comforter unto you. And what a blessed thought it is. And how comforting it is to know that he will abide with us forever. And we have the seal of the covenant in heaven with the sprinkling of the blood that's why he would not let Mar uh, Mary touch him until he had con consummated the temple worship. 
But later on he could say, Handle me and see, for the Spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And where he is honored dwells is where the Christian, the born-again person, should desire to be. Often, often I say, that ought to be a thirst almost like in a hot desert sun. A man ought to hunger and thirst after righteousness. He ought to be overtaken with the desire to be where God is and to be in fellowship with him. An unsaved man, when the days come and that eternal separation will be, and you'll be cut off from the land of the living, you'll be cut off from the life of God in the blackness of darkness forever and ever. Oh, the, the horror, the indescribable horror of hell without hope of eternal punishment without relief. The agonies of it all is beyond the human mind, and if a man thought upon it, he'd go stark raving mad when he thinks that I'll never be released. I'll never be out. I've talked to prisoners of war. I've talked to men both in World War II and in the Korean War and then in Vietnam and those terrible wars we've had since, and I suppose even now there may be uh, American men languishing somewhere in prison tonight. Who knows? But well, hear me tonight, people. Every prisoner, I suppose, has hope of one day maybe being released. But the soul that dies without God and goes out into Christless, hopeless eternity without hope, think of what it'll mean in the ceaseless ages of eternity never to be released. There's no such thing as purgatory or a purgeon or a halfway house. But when man dies, his destiny is sealed forever and ever and ever. And you need to listen to the preacher that you might think sensibly about eternal things. God's way is always best. God's way is always profitable. God's way is the way of victory. Paul said to the church at Rome, he said, we're like sheep, we're killed all the day long. And then he said, nay, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things to come, things present, nor things to come, nor any other creation shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus, our Lord, How to, what a comfort it is to be eternally saved and saved forever. Let's stand with our heads bowed.